Hello and welcome to my new office that I haven't decorated yet. In today's video, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite clinical tools, stool testing. And if you're like the rest of the folks who watch this channel and you're like the people I've worked with, you probably have done a bunch of these. Perhaps you've done some culture-based tests like the doctor's data test. Maybe you've done some PCR-based tests like the GIFX or the GI map. Maybe you've done some 16S tests like Biomsite or Ombre. Maybe you've even done some of the new kid on the block, the whole genome sequencing tests like BiomeFX. But something that I think needs to be brought up, which is why I'm making a video about it now, is how precise is the data that we're getting from these stool tests? And this time I'm not even criticizing individual labs and individual types of technology, although I have done that in, in the past on this channel. In this video, I'm talking more about the fact that stool is not homogenous. And if we were to sample from slightly different locations or different days, we're going to get slightly different information. So when you're looking at a test and you are seeing a quantifiable number that assesses your acromancia or your bifidobacterium, how big of a grain of salt do you need to take that data with? Can you say, oh my God, this test says my bifido is 3.233%. It is exactly that. Or are you going to say more so that it's probably like two, three, four percent, right? Let me show you a visual of what I'm talking about. Hold on, let me give myself a head bubble. So here I have taken the liberty of drawing your poop. You're welcome. And I think that sometimes what we assume and what clinicians can assume is that stool is more homogenous than it actually is. So we kind of picture you know, this red guy would live here, here, and here. Then we've got this nice purple, we've got this green one, and then we'll throw in the pink. And what this means, if you make this assumption, is that no matter where you sample, if you were to sample from here versus here versus here, you would get basically the same data, right? Wrong. What actually seems to happen is that there's going to be pockets so like, here's one pocket of bacteria that lives here. Maybe that's Fecalobacterium presidentii, for example. Then switch colors. Let's say there's another bacteria that likes to hang out right about here. Maybe that's Acromancia. But you're starting to get the idea that if we were to sample from different locations, we would get pretty darn different results. This is why when I did my split sample comparisons back in the fall, I had the patients stir the poop as much as they could before taking the sample, because I was trying to account for the fact that stool is just naturally not homogenous. Now, some companies like BiomeFX re recommend that you poke the stool sample in 10 to 12 locations prior to dipping that, that little um, bristly brush into the solution and mailing off your sample. Not all do that. Ombre says that you can just wipe a little bit from the toilet paper and away you go, good enough. I disagree with that. Um, and again, it's for this reason. I think that we need to be sampling from as many locations on that stool sample as humanly possible before we send it into a lab if we want something that is representative of our entire ecosystem. But even if we do that, it's not going to be perfect. So let me show you the data. I embarked on this journey for you, oh folks of YouTube. And I tried to do seven stool tests in seven days to assess how much variability there would be, how much noise there is in the data, day to day doing stool sampling. Because remember, not only is stool not homogenous, but also our diet varies from day to day, or at least I hope it does. So here's what we did. And what we're going to talk about is the standard deviation. I need to show you what that means first, though, for those of you who are not big statistics nerds, but the standard deviation is basically an assessment of how dispersed the data is compared to the mean or the average of that data. So in this case, the mean is right in the middle of that bell curve. And you can see that there's a fair amount of, of data on either side of it. That's one standard deviation out. And then another fair chunk, two standard deviations out. And then there's barely anything out at the tip of that graph. Another way to word it is this. So if we look at these three curves, all of these bell curves have the same mean, the same average, which is 50 in this case. But you can see the blue curve, it has a very narrow data set, meaning that most of the data points were right around 50. 
The green one is a little bit more bowed out, meaning that they had more data points down at like the 25 and 75 range. And then you can see that the yellow curve, there's a lot of variation in that data, even though the average is still 50. So you have a fair amount of people down in the 10, 20% range. You've got another fair amount of people up at like the 80, 90% range. You don't get that same span in the data with the blue curve here. So this is what we're looking at when we're looking at the standard deviation. It's how far out from the mean is a lot of the data and how widespread is it? So knowing that now we can just take a look, see, so I've got my Google sheet here. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, let's see, I'll put my head here. Um, and so we're just gonna break it down. So this was a series that I did with Ombre. This is a 16S test. Um, this is, it, I think it's a pretty good rough and dirty look at what your microbiome looks like. There's a handful of bacteria that I like to assess. It doesn't look at pathogens. It doesn't look at candida. It doesn't look at parasites. But if you want just an overall idea of what the ecosystem looks like, I think it does a pretty good job for like a hundred bucks. So that's what I chose to use. And that's what I've been using for some of my experiments here. Um, and if you look, so if you look at Firmicutes, for example, we're looking at big, broad groups called phyla. And the Firmicutes group, you can see that the data in that group, the first line ranges quite a bit. So one day, 20%, then 39, 67, 56, 66, 53, 76, 69. So you can see that the first one was an outlier by quite a bit, but even so, even if we knock that one out, I think that the standard deviation is still fairly spread for Firmicutes. Now, similarly, we can look at Bacteroidetes, similar span, about almost 20 points in this case. So you look and we've got some as low as 21% and some as high as 78%. Now the average, if you look at the average of these numbers, then I think we get better data collection. And we're going to talk a little bit about that at the end of the video. Uh, but you can see that there's a fair amount of noise. So I personally, my clinical style is that I don't tell people with 100% certainty, we could say this and, oh my gosh, we have the smoking gun because I know that that's just not true. Amy and I've talked about this a bit on the IBS Freedom podcast. We have a whole episode called Test Don't Guess, and we're kind of poking fun at that that slogan that functional medicine likes to use so much. Because even with testing, there's a fair amount of guessing. But let's move on to the genus information. Uh, so now we're getting a bit more specific. Again, I'm going to let my head bubble kind of hover in the middle of the screen just so I don't chop my head off. Uh, the individual numbers don't matter a ton here for you to look at anyway. But if you look, so we've got Prevotella and Bacteroides, standard deviation of about 9% for both of those. So and we've got a pretty good span all the way down to 10% for Bacteroides here, all the way up to 40% over here. So pretty different numbers. When we get down to some of the more well-known genuses like Bifidobacterium and Lactobacilli, not as much of a crazy span, but they also don't make up a ton of the microbiome to begin with. You could see that in this case, my Bifidobacteria got as low as 0.124 and as high as 0.449. So not a tremendous difference, about a quarter of a percent for the standard deviation. So quite a bit different here versus lactobacillus, even more narrow. So you could see I was pretty consistent with my lactobacilli being so low and they range from 0 0.00 something up to maybe 0.1 on a good day in this case. Now I will say here, if you're thinking, oh my God, her numbers are atrocious for a gut health person. Uh, cut me some freaking slack. I had surgery in January and the antibiotics really changed my microbiome. And that's going to be the other video in this two part series. So I was collecting this data to do this video and I was collecting this data so that we could talk about the pre and post effects of that dose of antibiotics. So hold your horses before you judge me people, but moving on, you can see that we have a bit of variability. Uh, for some of these butyrate producers. The big one I want to point out though here is the total butyrate producer cohort. And that varied more than I thought it would. So if you look over here, total butyrate producers at one point was up at 58%, which is beautiful. But then on this first sample, down at 12%. Again, I'm really starting to think that that first sample on 3323 was probably a weird outlier. And maybe I should just delete that and not factor that in with the data collection. Um, 
But even so, even if we knock that one out, we still go as low as 24.9% all the way up to 58%. So those are telling pretty different stories, right? If I had somebody with total butyrate producers of 25%, I would be telling them they need to really bump up their butyrate producers and have a lot of resistant starch and FODMAPs and prebiotics. Versus if I saw somebody with 58% butyrate producers, I'd be giving them high fives. I'd be like, oh my God, you champion, you rock star. This is amazing. So even a stool test that I like and I think is fairly accurate, we're still going to get a lot of variation in the data on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's move on to the species level, and then we're going to bring this home and talk about what the heck do you do now with this information. So here are some of the individual named species that I like to keep an eye on, for me at least. And again, you could see pretty good span. We're, going to, we're just going to ignore this Y column for right now because I am thinking that's a bit of an outlier. But still, if you look at Fecalobacterium presnitzii, a good keystone species, all the way up to 27% or as low as 8.7%. And again, I'm telling these two people two different things. I'm going to tell this person down at 9% that that's not the greatest and we need to feed Fecalobacterium presnitzii. This person, I'm going to give high fives. So, you know what do we do with this? Acromancia, similarly. And again, this was one that was really trashed by the antibiotics. So don't judge me harshly for the acromancia being so low, people. But acromancia is still a little bit of a span. It got all the way down to 0 0.004 and as high as 0 0.5, 0 0.59 in one sample. So let me take me out of head bubble mode. The question of the day always with these videos is, what the heck do you do? And what does this mean for you in your journey, right? You're not watching this video for funsies. You're not watching it just because you think I'm charming, although that might be one of the reasons. You're here because you want to feel better and you want to figure out what path to take to get out of whatever IBS, SIBO, et cetera, hell you're in right now. So my recommendation to you is not to necessarily throw out all stool testing. Again, I still use it with my patients. I think that it can be useful, but here's the thing. The more data points you have, the more you can make sense out of this information. So if you do a single GI map or a single GI effects or a single ombre or a single biome site or a single whatever, you're going to get a glimpse of what's going on, but it's not going to tell you the whole story. Now, in an ideal world, all of us would be doing one sample and again, poking the poop multiple times like I did for these samples. We would be doing that every day for a week or more to really get an understanding of what our ecosystem looks like. But I know that that's cost prohibitive and a lot of people just don't want to handle their poop that many times in the name of science. And I get that. So A, my recommendation is if you can do more than one sample, that's great. I think that's going to give you more reliable information and you can take the averages of all of these. Again, ombre is like a hundred bucks. So you can do a couple of those. You could do three or four ombre tests for the cost of a GI map as one example. So I kind of like that better because you get more data and you can kind of rely on it a bit more, I think, because you have multiple samples and you could take the averages. So if you're able to do more sampling, that's great. It, again, poke in the poop, multiple locations. That's really important here. If that is not in the cards and you're just trying to figure out how to make sense of your previously done stool testing, I would just say, take it with a grain of salt. So if you're thinking, oh my God, I'm doomed because I have this overgrowth of this one thing, or this one is totally gone, or this one is super low, maybe just, I don't know. I'm not going to say throw that data out entirely, but just try not to stress about it too, too much. Remember too, with testing, we are coming up with a hypothesis and then we have to test the hypothesis. So if you see elevated Klebsiella on a stool test, you are then going to hypothesize that it's the elevated Klebsiella causing your symptoms. The way you test that hypothesis is that you try to treat the Klebsiella and you see, do your symptoms get better, yes or no? If the answer is no, then that means it's less likely that the Klebsiella was an accurate test, or if it's really there, it makes it less likely that it was actually driving your symptoms. It could have been asymptomatic for all you knew, right? So I think that, again, Sample multiple times, if you can. Poke the poop multiple times. That is absolutely necessary, in my opinion. B, if you have stool testing and you're trying to make sense of it now, take it with a large grade of salt and, and just test your hypothesis. 
Don't take any single stool test as gospel. You have to test it and see, do I feel better when I treat this thing or no? And if the answer is no, then there's two possibilities in my opinion. Either that was not an accurate test. I think that's more of an issue with certain stool tests than others. Or that thing that is really there just is not driving your symptoms for whatever reason. You were coping with that Klebsiella or you were coping with that Candida reasonably well, and there's some other thing that's causing your symptoms. I hope that this was helpful. I hope that my week-long stool test experiment was worth it in some way. As always, thank you for tuning in and thank you for sharing these videos wherever you feel they are needed or helpful to others. I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.